started. Uh, now we have the mass deployment buff uh, with Thomas Nanga of University of Cologne. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Hello at the TVs and on IRC. So what I like to do is um, talk or discuss about mass deployment. Uh, there was a talk before, uh, which was a special case about deployment of embedded devices. And um, some things about me. I'm a developer since over 10 years. Um, I also doing the fully automatic installation tool since more than 11 years. But that's not the main topic today. The topic is what are the general problems during mass installation? And maybe not uh, now, especially for the embedded devices, but for deploying servers or laptops or, yeah, mainly desktops. So what are the problems there? Are there still, or which tools are available there? Which tools are you using? And uh, do, do you have any experiences with those tools? Uh, uh, do we have Debian packages for those tools? Uh, or which problems arise when you scale to a very large number of machines? So this is what I like to discuss with you. There are some keywords that are often used when doing mass installation. Uh, it's sometimes called provisioning or uh, Linux rollout, software deployment. So if you look for some tools that are doing installation or deployment. There's also the software deployment uh, topic. We had also hardware inventory that is often part of the installation. Um, what we will not cover here is the monitoring. So there are some products or some tools which can install your machine, update your machine, and also monitor your machine or which can also um, have the user database within uh, a certain database. Also, the life cycle management of your hardware started from buying a machine, getting all the serial numbers and whatever, uh, things like asset management. I think we, uh, I will not cover these topics. I'm mainly, installed in, in, uh, I'm mainly interested in the topics, the initial installation, um, the update of the systems, what about different boot media with mass installation? You normally do, net, do network installation, but is it also possible, or how easy is it possible, to turn this network installation into a bootable media so you can install uh, sites that are not online at a certain moment with a CD, DVD, or USB stick? Uh, can you use the same installation method or deployment thing also for creating change routes or for, for setting up your virtual machines uh, or building a live image or a bootable ISO image. Then configuration management. This is a special part of the installation and sometimes people mix those topics installation and configuration management together. We can also uh, have a little discussion about is it the same or which are the difference between those. Yeah, disaster recovery, like, oh, something crashed, just reinstall the machine. I'm very interested, or what I'm using in Fi is also that I have sort of a automatic documentation. So if I've done a rollout, I can have also the documentation, which machine were installed in which way. What about supporting different Linux distributions or even this um, different uh, OSs. Uh, is this important for you? Or, or can you say, oh, I only like to deploy Debian machines? Um, and sometimes people say, yeah, I, can, I have a tool which I can use for deploying desktops, but I do not deploy servers or I cannot deploy notebooks with it. So these are some topics that I like to discuss. So, any questions or any comments? Who is, uh, maybe the first question, whoever did a sort of automatic installation of one or 10 or 100 machines? So, I would say, yeah, more than half of the things. So, did you have any problems or what, what tools were you using? So, maybe someone can just 
tell us what he's using now, what, what is he missing? So, two people are using phi. This one. So, for, for our 300 uh, server setup, we had like a customized promo network boot and the deep bootstrap from there, and then using Puppet to boot it. So, everyone, everyone could hear it? Network installation with the bootstrap and then customized, yeah some wrapper scripts around it, I guess, yeah. That's what a lot of people are doing, yeah, just starting from scratch with, yeah, Pixie Network Boot, doing the debootstrap, and that's it. Uh, question for me, how do you do the partitioning of the hard disk? Yeah, SF disk. SF disk. Um, we actually deployed just a single partition standard size on all machines, and everything beyond, so we installed uh, rootfs there, everything beyond that was managed from Puppet with various commands. Yeah. Puppet is uh, a good keyword. Puppet is the configuration management part. So for me, that's a different part. That's a customization of the tools. So who else did some installation and wants to tell us which tools or what, which kind of scripts did you wrote? We used to have uh, Red Hat. Uh, right now it's uh, CentOS. Yeah. Um, it is kind of two-step installation. Like there, was an, uh, there is an installation CD-ROM. Uh, the first install is like doing partitions and installing Windows for Toolboot. And then uh, uh, in the second step, uh, you choose uh, the Linux installation setup, and it basically yeah gets IP address uh, via DHCP, and then it does an rsync. Yeah, that's basically it. So yeah. Yeah. So so in, you're not using the kickstart method from Red Hat and CentOS. Uh, no, no. Okay. But uh, this setup is going to d to die anywhere, and that's why I'm here. Okay. <laughs> I work. I work for a university, uh, and uh, uh, every, at, at the start of the every semester, uh, we uh, roll out a new image to every PC. That means uh, the, uh, the desktop machine is uh, in the labs. Uh, it's about 150 machines, and uh, uh, we just set up a network bootable, pre 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 previewed uh, executable uh, system with the network booting. Uh, which uh, boots uh, a very basic debootstrap uh, system for an installation. And uh, we do the tweaking on one machine, because these are uniform uh, machines, or more or less. Uh, well, uh, the, in, in Linux, it's, it's a bit easier, because uh, X can auto-configure itself uh, for the hardware, and we make some tweaking uh, on top of that. But uh, mostly, it's just uh, uh, netcat, uh, and tar for uh, uh, making the partitions and uh, populating the files, and in the end, uh, setting up the bootloader. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, for Windows, we uh, use the NTFS clone uh, package uh, uh, in a similar way. Uh, we set up, uh, we tweak, uh, we make, make the tweetings. Uh, uh, on one machine and populate these to the others and uh, yeah and uh, then we join the domain and that's all so for linux you're also using kind of image that you put on the yeah the, hard disk? the, the, the init script is uh, the one uh, which uh, does the in installation and uh, uh, the, the the init script is a special script uh, which fetches these images and uh, yeah. For, formats the hard disk and okay, uh, yeah. partitions the hard so, disk so with, with SF disk. So one question from me, how do you create this image? Manually or do you have some scripts that automatically creates your image that you then deploy to your desktops? Uh, I, uh, uh, I boot uh, 
Grammel uh, CD uh, on one of these machines or, or this kind of uh, environment with, with a network boot. And uh, there, is a, there is a special mode which interrupts the automatic installation mode. And this way I can upload the image. I just open a netcat on one of the ports and do it manually or, or one, uh, one command. Okay, so but preparing the images is, is mostly automatic. And, or is there much manual work you have to do before you can create the image? Uh, mo mostly I just do a, a, a apt, apt get a update and this upgrade on, on, okay, on yeah. my machine. That's one important point for me, um, that I think that doing deployment with, with images, sometimes it called you have a master or a golden image, this does not scale in, in, in my opinion. Because often this, or mostly every time, people are creating these images manually. So uh, even if you think, oh, I have all my 100 computers are the same and need the same uh, software, you, you create, uh, you do a manual installation of one machine and doing some customization on it, then creating a tarball or some other image. Uh, but this does not scale because um, there will be times where you say, oh, we have different hardware or another department needs some other software and then you will create the second, the third and so on. And you have a lot of images that you always create manually. So I would uh, suppose try to, cr if you really need images that you want to deploy, I think it's a very bad thing. But then try to optimize this part that your images are created automatically. That's very important. Uh, th th there are uh, three or four flavors uh, of these things. Uh, yeah. But uh, this mostly uh, means if the, uh, in one lab there is a special NVIDIA card uh, in, in the machine, the installation process knows that this is the special lab and uh, installs uh, one dev package and, and co uh, copies over one or two configuration files. But yeah, it's not that easy, but. Yeah. Uh, Philip Hahn for Univention. Uh, we have uh, Debian based uh, distribution, our own distribution. And basically, we are doing uh, profiles. Uh, we have our own install program, uh, which gets a profile with uh, information about partitioning, uh, then installs a base system, and later on, uh, we have a LDAP-based management system where you can configure uh, on which computer you want, which software installed, and it regularly pulls from the LDAP what software to install and which software to purge and to update. So this is that, that you have your configuration um, management database in LDAP and get all the information from LDAP and then have some script that uh, customize your machines. Exactly, and, and you can also hook in a custom shell scripts if you need real special things. Yeah. Uh, and you can also prepare a CD or DVD uh, with a profile included so you can do installations via DVD or uh, also via PXE. So for customization, you, you only need shell scripts, or do you use something like CF Engine, Puppet, or? Uh, no, uh, mostly sh shell scripts, and we have uh, an extension uh, which is called uh, something like a registry system where you can set a kind of variables which will trigger an update process which will modify the configuration files on the system. Yeah. Uh, here's a li list of some tools and uh, the third line, the CF Engine Puppet Chef, BCF G2, these are more tools that are only for the um, uh, configuration management and uh, you, you really have to distinguish between deployment or installation and configuration management. You cannot use Puppet or CF Engine uh, for installing a machine. Uh, you can only run CF Engine, Puppet and the, the other tools if you have a running, lin running Linux system on this. So what's Fi doing and some other tools, uh, you can take a computer with only zeros on its hard disk and then do the network boot, partition the disk, and install the system. Often people are using then something like CF Engine Puppet 
for the customization uh, part, but CF Engine Puppet and the other tools are no installation tools. These are only for configuration management. You are, you uh, can, can you put the mic a little bit sorry. more? You have two kind of things in where I work. We have a desktop for the university, one cent, one, uh, about 100 desktops, and they are installed with, with an uh, in image because they have to Windows and Linux. The image are made manually, and in the end, it's created on the reference machine, and the image is propagated for all the labs using a proprietary software that can replicate the Windows and Linux. In the case of the Linux, there are um, the configuration. I do the best to fetch all the configurations in some Debian package, personally, all the configurations, so what uh, in the end, I just need to un edit some configuration, some files, and my package try read, read the personality of the computer, try to configure everything. The hardware is similar, but not equal. So if uh, X can detect all the hardware, sometimes there are some bugs, new hardware, so when machine boots, I try to detect the model of the computer by the graphic cards, I have a program, SwitchConf, that changes the x files configuration, whatever it needs about the hardware, for the best thing. This is done on the boot, so the image can be the same for all the computers, what, what is different inside there and inside it on the boot. Yeah. And this idea I take to the servers. Servers are, say, I have a script, a manual script to follow, so where it says, how partition, how much partition I have in the machine, size of it. <coughs> and I use meta package for the role, so this is a server, I have a group of software to install, this is a firewall, I install more software, mm. and I use the same kind of, in the end, I just edit some trash files, configure something manually, and uh, in the end I have a machine install it, and pre-configured what is a base for all the servers that they have to manage. Yeah, so, so you, you have a lot of configuration information inside Debian packages, and yes. if you make changes to your configuration information, you need to create a new Debian package, yes. deploy it, and, and, and update and a, it. And a, a typical yeah. upgrade, security yeah. upgrade, that yeah. kind of thing. Uh, uh, I know a lot of people doing this kind of thing. I, I would not like to do this because there, there's an additional step um, you cannot just change the configuration files and de deploy, them, de deploy them, but you have to create the Debian package which contains the, the uh, new versions of the configuration files. And I think it, it's, it's one step less if you do not put them all in a package, but uh, distribute them in another way. That's also possible, and that's what we are doing in Phi. The and I think, yeah. The problem I see is if I distribute another way, I will have to have a server for distributing that files. Yeah, and but my way, I don't need the only thing that is central is a local repository. So everyone yeah. that wants to manage server just have to fetch what software yeah. that needs. So, but 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 also if you apt fetch some packages, you also need a server where you fetch them from. So I think that's no difference. Yeah, but I think uh, once you have uh, those things figured out, when you, uh, once you have centralized your um, your infrastructure to actually provide central updates and installations, then uh, putting configurations into a package becomes natural because that's uh, the easiest thing you can do in your infra. You just roll out a package everywhere. So, some more opinions about pu putting configuration data into packages? Okay, I think, yeah, I would not, not do it. Uh, uh, here's a short list of image-based tools. Um, I already said I'm really not a friend of those things. One other problem I see if you just write a simple, simple shell script and do some uh, SF disk things is that you will have problems in the future 
because SF disk only supports MS-DOS disk labels, so if you have really huge disks, this will not work. The other part is um, if you like to have software rate or LVM configuration, um, does anyone does this with some sort of automation or scripts? Or is then the normal installation, or oh, uh, I'm booting a, an installation system and then I have a shell where I do then CF disk and my normal commands and then maybe some automatic part runs after the bot? Yeah, so um, certainly at work they, they use it to manage their, their desktops for all the developers. And essentially they use, um, as of kindly some work that Phil Hans did, the auto installer magic um, combined with some pre-seeding and, uh, and the automatic mode. And that, that really does. So essentially the IT department, when I first got there, were entirely Windows users. So we basically gave them a Debian CD, told them to go to automatic mode hit enter on a, on a network and it just installs a system to them and it puts all the developers tools and the tool chains they need and puts everything under LVM and, and the rest of it so that does work quite well for them. Yeah. But we do put all the configuration in still in, in one package itself as well. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so does anybody think that um, the network may be a bottleneck during deployment of desktops? Do we need multicast deployments or? Yep. I thought uh, Clownzilla uses multicast to speed up. Yeah, maybe it uses it, but yeah, image-based distribution is. I think it's not good. <laughs> Even if you use multicast, and uh, I think people have, have to pay attention that multicast is not that easy as using just the normal network. For example, I heard people were using multicast, a multicast protocol, but they had really dumb uh, network switches that yeah could not really do multicast, but sent the packages one after another to every port. So I always say keep it s stupid and simple. And uh, I know a lot of really big or huge installations which has, have good network and they never accounted network problems. It's always the, the question, for example, it's in FIWARE using NFS during the installation and people always say, oh, net you will have network problems because NFS does not scale but we, we will never have problems. We only use it read-only without uh, file locking and so on, and it always shows us that, yeah, it's working. So don't be afraid that you will have network problems. Um, so if you're going to redeploy and enter a classroom um, in a school environment, you usually do not have um, expensive network hardware or expensive servers, and there you really need to use uh, multicast or broadcast. Some legacy software supports that, and you know to not saturate uh, the server uplink, basically. Um, I uh, yeah. In, if you saturate the network uplink, this is, in my opinion, maybe perfect because then the server will use all its bandwidth to, to give the packages to the client. So in my opinion, this is no problem. And if, if you do, for example, if you have uh, computer classes and need, need, uh, needs to reinstall after each class um, 20 or 50 machines, I would say, uh, just buy a 10 euro network card that is only used for this one and during the installation uh, the, this, this network card of the server can be saturated. Why not? Yeah, but it's still a time problem then. You know, um, when I was doing this it was common to have 100 megabit switches. Yeah. And then you only have so much bandwidth and so much time. So 
it was a requirement, basically. Yeah. Okay. This probably has changed by now. Yeah. So, other questions? What could be a problem or what do you wish from a perfect installation deployment tool? I suppose um, just just going back to the the multicast question. Um, uh, the other thing we what we actually produced we produced IPTV set top boxes, and uh, so when we're when we're deploying say a million of these Linux based boxes, then then you need to use multicast. Um, but but one of the things I would say, unless you're dealing with something on that scale, and, and even when you are in fact, then um, Unicast scales a lot better than multicast unless you really, really know what you're doing. You end up with all sorts of interesting bugs to do with. Uh, and if you don't know what an IGMP query election is, then, then you really don't want to go anywhere near multicast because it will create all sorts of problems. Um, even in some of our other products, so for the large, more traditional distribution-based ones, we're still just using HTTP. And that does work really quite well. Um, Multicast will cause a lot of pain unless it's a very specific instance that you're after. And I also, uh, I also think if you're doing the deployment, the, the huge amount of data that's, that is transferred uh, via the network are the packages. Uh, everything else, uh, it's just peanuts. Uh, so uh, it's very easy to set up a second or maybe 10 of... Um, HTTP daemons on different machines which just provides the packages. And this, that scales very well. So if you're, doing, uh, if you're doing a larger installation, just try it. Oh, if one server is not enough, maybe I, I just use three or four server for the packages. Yeah? Comment on this? Proxy. Caching proxies. Uh, I would just go with, with maybe an R-Sync uh, mirror of the packages that's, yeah, maybe easier than that. Uh, apt cache and app proxy, for example, I know people that are using caching like this uh, have sometimes problems, but yeah, in, in, if you say a, a simple HTTP proxy and you know how to configure it and it works, yeah, fine. Just do this before starting unicast, anycast, or some very complicated but cool network protocols. Torrent or maybe if we have app Torrent working just out of the box, yeah, I will also give it a try. Uh, we use multicast for distributing the image for the desktops and the bottleneck is the quality of the switch. When there are new switch, the server are dedicated, therefore fast gigabit for the VLAN where are the clients and you can distribute an image of 80 gigabytes to three hours. If you go to place of the building with load switch and the uh, time goes to 10 hours or worse than that, or even instead of using multicast, you may need to switch to unicast. So our problem is not software. Software is good enough. The multicast team on Debian for the routers is good enough. Problem is the switch. Switch mm -hmm. needs to understand multicast protocols. Yeah. Okay, I think the, the network topic is uh, we, we know how to solve this once. So, are there other things? Build. Uh, I like to switch back to my foils and um, <clears throat> what about uh, creating virtual machines, change root environments? Are there people that also have some sort of scripts or automatic building things or do you use th the same tool for installing your desktops and your virtual machines and creating your change routes? Or do you say, oh, change, building a change route is just calling the bootstrap, then jump into the change route and yeah, call my lovely editor? 
What about this one tool for all of them? Change route, virtual machines. Uh, for development, we have uh, created virtual machines re using our regular installer, but we save these uh, regular uh, installations uh, and clone images from that because it's just a fire and forgot, clone a new image, start it, uh, it's uh, running in a, s a couple of seconds, you do your work and uh, if you're done, you just delete it. So uh, for uh, software development, uh, using disk-based image is really nice. But only if you create your disk-based image we are an automatic installation tool, not if you do this manually. Yeah. <laughs> so, all other people are just doing manual installation of their virtual machines and then copying the disk images? Uh, does anybody has some sort of partly automation? It's a slightly different emphasis because we're actually doing embedded devices rather, but we're still doing a mass deployment with an automated uh, installation mechanism, but it it's actually a little uh, bit louder. Cannot understand. We're actually doing it on an embedded basis. So we're actually doing it as a, a binary flow onto the onto the NAND. So we're doing it as trying to prepare the the image and then just uh, sending the the image directly onto the onto the flash. So yeah. it's a, it's a different kind of mechanism, but it's still a uh, a mass deployment on that basis. But on the on the server side, um, we don't we we generally do it by hand. Yeah. the actual um, two routes and things that we to set up. Well, one question I have is uh, when doing an installation on embedded devices, I think um, it took a long time if you just would do the normal installation and not an image-based thing. Yeah, so we do the majority of, of the actual preparation of it on a AMD 64 or something with a big fast hard drive. And then there is a slow stage where you've actually got to configure on device, but then you do that once. You put the image on the server, and then as you go through production, it's just a case of, well, there's a static image. It's just a lump of binary, and you just flow it straight yeah. onto the device. So, so, so the bandwidth of the local drive is, is not that bad, but uh, if you would do the normal installation, uh, the slow CPU would be a problem. If you just would call DD package or apt get for every yeah. package. It's not just the actual CPU. The CPU isn't that bad. It's the uh, it's right into the um, to the NAND storage. That's what takes the time. Okay. Uh, yeah. Reading from the storage is fast. Right into the storage just takes a long time. If you've got several hundred megabytes to actually write individually uh, in in the way the dpackage does it, which is to unpack it, check it, move yeah. it around, delete it, then it's just going to take forever. What what what, what we are doing in Fires. Uh, when, when we called the debootstrap part, we also need this. And before installing additional package, we put a RAM disk onto varlib dpackage. And this speeds up the installation a lot. Because during the installation, a lot of temporary files are created there. And if you just put everything, it's for a desktop machine, we need about 90 megabytes of RAM disk. If you put everything into a RAM disk, then install additional packages, and in the end, put the content of the RAM disk back to disk, this speeds up a lot. We haven't got that much RAM. <laughs> okay. It's an embedded <laughs> device. It doesn't have yeah. a lot of RAM. But um, maybe you could swap. But the, the other thing is that you don't necessarily need, we don't have, we, there is no swap. Either. Yeah. Um, so you, you don't need to use something like Bootstrap, which is focused on uh, preparing a, a, a cheroot on a system other than Debian and making it sure it's only really the, the pure uh, based system. If you use other tools to recreate your, your, your root of S, then you can actually put all the packages you need for your base platform onto the, the, the first run of the root on the fast hard drive and then bring that out. And you've only got a handful of packages to then install on, on, on top. So we use that with mDebian and with Multistrap and we do the whole thing in one operation. Yeah. It creates the device nodes as well if you need them to. Yeah. I think embedded devices are really a special case where you cannot use the normal yeah. 
deployment tools, except for, yeah, I create an image and try to put the image onto the local disk. So, other questions? What I'd like to show you uh, is a list of users um, that ha has, have been using Phi. Uh, as I already said, we are doing this since more than 10 years. And uh, what's, what's very nice is that we have a lot of experiences with very different hardware architectures. There were even some installations with Itanium, uh, PowerPC in the past. Um, as, oh, maybe it's a little bit too small. We also have people that are using Phi for installing Debian machines on IBM mainframes. So I'm a little bit proud that uh, during this time, uh, it has been proved that Phi is very flexible, even on very different or complicated hardware architectures, and that it could also uh, be used in very different environments, like uh, just a lab that I want to install or, for example, in the second line, the L4M insurance, it's a German insurance. They deployed, I think it's not 10, maybe 12,000 machines spread all over uh, Germany, and they, they have very low bandwidth. So they, they would like to have something like uh, apt um, delta or depackage delta so uh, they could on, that they only could transfer very limited packages to their mostly notebooks, I think, um, during some, some time, and if they have all packages on their local machine, then doing the uh, reboot. A, um, a, a question from IRC is, um, is it possible to automatically handle F LVM partitioning when, when doing deployments like this? Um, can it be preceded or handled through another mechanism, for example, uh, a given logical volume takes 50% of the disk space. Yeah. I'm not sure if DI can do this. Um, what I only can say that doing the partitioning with DI preceding is, in my opinion, horrible because it's not that readable. It's, it's very hard uh, to, to partitioning the things. Uh, and if you have very complicated setups, uh, partitioning setups, uh, I think this will also not work. What I can show you is what we are using in Phi. It's, it's like an extended FS tab. So I'm pretty sure everyone that takes a look at it then can just write down such a configuration. And we, we've written a tool in Perl which parses this input and then creates part at commands, which then creates the partitioning uh, file systems, uh, LVM software rate, and so on. So this tool is also available as a Debian package, and you do not need, uh, do not need to use the whole file, file environment. So if you like to just use this tool for partitioning, that's available and very nice to use. There's a question from Peter. <laughs> If it is available and very nice, why don't you make a UDEB for it? If it is available and very nice, why don't you make a UDEB of it so it can be used uh, from Debian installer? So, so the question was, if this tool is available, why do not we have a UDEB? Was this right? So I'm, uh, I th I'm not sure. Is Perl available in, during DI installations? OK, we need Perl and part it. So, but but the, there was this question: if it's possible, also to also to say, um, try to get fifty percent of the whole disk for partitioning. This is what we can do with our tool. You can uh, have a minimum and maximal size, and sure, it's also possible to, to define uh, a percentage of the whole disk there. 
Five minutes left. So, other commands. What do we need, or do we have all the perfect installation tools that solves all our problems? Oh, is everyone happy with DI manually installations? So, if there are no more questions, then thank you very much for the discussion. And if anybody likes to have more information about FI, I have also some flyers here, or you can just ask me later. Thank you. <laughs>